humbled to have you in our midst. Good afternoon, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope uh, my role is a very, very small and short one. And uh, it's a very short one in the sense that I'll be introducing to you uh, what I call the man of the house. And uh, the man of the house, who is our VC and Vice Chancellor, Professor Peterson. Professor Peterson, as you know him very well, I hope you all know uh, 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 Prof uh, Professor Peterson. Professor Peterson is uh, one of those uh, VCs that, you know, as a, as, a, as a subordinate to Professor Peterson, I actually look so much upon him, a, a, a man of stature, a, an engineer who is different from all engineers that you can think of. Uh, you, you might be aware that, you know, sometimes when you deal with engineers, you might be a bit scared that you are going to be dealing or working with this person that is actually different or going to be, uh, you know, feel you not be as a person. But I must say, having worked with a vice chancellor and VC and, uh, uh, of the University of the Free State, Professor Peterson, she, he is indeed one of those that we can actually learn so much from him, his passion about people, his passion about wellness of staff, his passion about the spirit of Ubuntu, his passion about staff and student wellness. And yes, as we celebrate this month, Heritage Month, this resonates so well with our VC that we dearly respect. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will enjoy as we engage with all the authors and over to you, Professor Peterson. Thank you so much. All right, uh, I hope that you can hear me and thank you very much, uh, um, Maria. Uh, um, I was a little bit worried that you uh, you were you were uh, were so complimentary about me that I thought it would would have been my book launch, uh, but but I'm here for a different purpose. So I first just also would like to say thank you uh, to you uh, for putting this program together around uh, um, around Heritage uh, Day. Uh, we in fact Heritage Day is the 24th of September, but around Heritage Month and this particular event of um, of uh, of the book launch uh, that we will go into but i also would like to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one that is present here this afternoon uh, and, uh, and 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 we will be engaging uh, with 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 each other uh, around this uh, particular and critical issue so when you when you were talking about engineering i thought you were falling in the trap of stereotyping engineers uh, um, uh, which, which I think is, 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 uh, is, is but that is not exactly, exactly what you have said, uh, but that is, I think, what we always have to be very careful of. But it's indeed an honor and pleasure for me to, to make a few remarks um, at this important book launch. Um, the book Rethinking Africa, Indigenous Women Reinterpret South Africa's Past, is, um, is, is, is the first of its kind in Africa, and I believe also in the world. Uh, so compliments to the two authors and and uh, and what an honor to have a contributor also from the University of the Free State, um, the research fellow Bernadette Muthian and, and also June Baum uh, from um, my um, one of my alma maters, uh, the University of Cape Town uh, from the Koi and San unit at the University of Cape Town uh, is really is you are you are the um, uh, um, the, the key people that we actually have to be referring to uh, today and this afternoon, and I would like you like to welcome you certainly from um, from the University of the Free State perspective, but also uh, for um, for using this platform uh, to launch this particular book. So also congratulations. I think it would be in order 
and thanks to the University of the Free State Neville Alexander Library and the South Campus Research Unit for arranging such a significant initiative. And I would like to say thank you to Maria uh, and her team uh, for, for laying the foundation and in fact the platform for us to be able to launch uh, this, this book. Now during this launch you will get to meet uh, the contributors and learn more about them. Um, so therefore I'm not going to elaborate on each, on, 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 on each of them this, uh, in my particular talk, uh, but I can just probably say that you are in superb company and the program director will, uh, will interview uh, uh, the individuals at the later stage. But also from my side, I would like to welcome you. Now, on the 24th of September every year, South Africans celebrate their colorful heritage in creative ways. Um, and however, these festivals uh, should not overshadow the meaning of this day and this month. Um, you know, I was referring to earlier about Heritage Month and Heritage Day. Living heritage is, uh, is the core of all our communities and the source of our identity. It informs who we are and how we view the events around us. And I was uh, um, on, on Sunday evening participated in a discussion, uh, uh, um, uh, a radio discussion around Heritage Day and Heritage Month. And we are talking about the technical definition of what it actually means, but what does it actually means for individuals? And now it's an opportunity to to reflect uh, uh, really uh, 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 on who we are, uh, on the way that we live, and it's also an opportunity to be able to learn from other cultures, uh, um, to learn from other people. But very importantly, it's an opportunity. To, to be able to look at those things that are in common and that would be able to bind us together. Now that was the background of, 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 of Heritage Month and how it actually means to individuals. But living heritage encapsulates precious and valuable traditions, knowledge and skills that are unique in the communities, but also universal in its application. And it's our duty to ensure that our various heritages live on. That is not only remembered, but is also encouraged. And to a certain extent, it brings to the fore the whole aspect of valuing diversity. Uh, um, and, 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 and this particular angle of Heritage Months is another demonstration that uh, it's important for us not to forget where we come from, but to what extent we can utilize that, we can use that in a way to add value, to assist our community to be able to move forward. And we need that diverse input. One way to share and engage with different heritages is to write and read about it. Um, fittingly this year, our government encourages all South Africans to support the culture of reading and to incorporate it into their daily lives. And for me, heritage forms part of one's identity and how we live it, how we uh, 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 live it and show it to others and how others would also experience that. And that bring me to, um, and, and I think, you know, if we have more time, we could have debated that a little bit more critically. But, but we, we often, in a South African uh, perspective, and specifically in our education, uh, but also in other, organization, other organizations, we've been talking to the whole issue of transformation. And, 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 and obviously, we have been building the transformation project uh, within universities, uh, in our university. Uh, the bedrock of our transformation discussion is our integrated transformation plan. But then we, we, we also pursue that discussion beyond transformation, and that is the whole issue of decolonization. And, 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 and I certainly, and there's different interpretations probably how we look at decolonization, but for me, decolonization can be viewed as an integral part of transformation, which must involve not only an epistemological 
an intellectual paradigm shift, but also an internal willingness to interrogate our own value system, our prejudices, our inherent, uh, or somebody just to mute themselves there, uh, um, but also an internal willingness to interrogate our own value systems, our prejudices, and inherent assumptions about ourselves, our history or histories, our cultures, and convictions that tied with our identities. And, and, and it is to bring, I probably would say in a more layman's term, it is to bring those voices that were and are previously marginalized to be more visible. And, 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 and th this is actually a powerful, uh, a, a powerful intellectual debate in discourse that we have to engage with. And different universities and different nations and societies are engaging with this. And I believe that within the University of the Free State, that is something that I would like to see much more happening. And I believe as we rethink in making sense of to understand what knowledge look like from a particular Africa lens, because we in Africa, the continent, but there's also other 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 nations that are going through the same conversation, the whole conversation of decolonization. And I believe that this book, Rethinking Africa, Indigenous Women Reinterpret South Africa's Past, is doing exactly that. Um, the experience of women, and in this particular case, indigenous women and their stories. But what is what is what is for me quite uh, uh, um, interested, interesting is the fact that these stories are told by themselves and, and the experiences that they had. And, and within a decolonization debate and discussion, one also would say the value that we have lost as, 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 as I think as a, as a knowledge project, as a knowledge system, not having those voices uh, being part of those knowledge and being part of that discussion. And I want to express my gratitude to all the contributors to this book and specifically Bernadette in June, um, to all the role players that made it possible. I know much time and hard work goes into such a project. And I would invite everyone to get a, a copy of this book. And, 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 and we utilize this book in terms of our discussions, uh, our debates about the broader issues of, of decolonization, the broader issues about invisible voices that hasn't been there and weren't, be, and weren't there, and the fact to what value those voices can add more to our intellectual project in our intellectual discourse going forward. So once again, uh, congratulations to Bernadette and June, and, and I certainly uh, 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 you know, I haven't received a copy of this book yet, and I will make sure that I'll get a copy, but I would invite everyone to get a copy of this particular book. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you once again to Bernadette and June. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Peterson, for those um thought-provoking um, words of insight. Um, it really makes one to, to ponder. And thanks a lot to um, Dr. Mario Ope for the warm welcome as well. My name is Dina Mashian and I will be moderating um, this event. Firstly, just to give a bit of background, this is a book launch in collaboration with the Neville Alexandra Library and the research unit on the UFS South Campus in celebration of Women's Month. Therefore, it was befitting to launch this particular book as it also coincides with this year's Heritage Month theme, which is the year of Charlotte Matreke, celebrating South Africa's intangible cultural heritage. The book is currently in the process of being procured and will um, eventually be part of the library's collection. On behalf of the UFS Library and Information Services, and the South Campus Research Unit, we are very privileged to have a panel that consists of individuals from diverse backgrounds and also various fields for this particular engagement. 
In addition to this, we will also have um, poetry recitals. Um, colleagues, before we hand over to our panelists, we all know that each and every house has, has um, rules of conduct. And as such, kindly note the following housekeeping rules. Um, today's session is currently being recorded and would be made, made available to all the attendees. And the video will also be available on the UFS Library YouTube channel. Each panel member will have a total of 10 to 15 minutes to share with their to share with us their opinions and views um, relating to to the book that we're currently launching. We will hold all questions until all, all panel members have have engaged with us due to for, for the sake of time. And therefore, you are kindly requested to note down all the questions that you might have um, for later. Um, without wasting any more time, um, colleagues, uh, please welcome, please um, welcome Ms. Benedict Mutten, the editor and also one of the panelists uh, who would be um, engaging on today's um, event. And uh, Ms. Mutten is currently a research fellow in the University of the Free State who for over 20 years has um, held executive and senior management positions in academia, civil society, and the public sector in South Africa and abroad. She's an accomplished facilitator, researcher, and a poet who designs, implements, and evaluates projects for diverse institutions locally and internationally. She has over 200 publications and conference presentations to her name, some of which have been translated from English into at least 16 other languages. She was the first Fulbright Amy Bell Fellow in Stanford University and holds postgraduate degrees in political sciences. She served on the Executive Council of the International Peace Research Association and was a co-founder of the African Peace Research and Education Association. She serves on various international advisory boards, including those of the International Journal of Human Security and International Institute on Peace Education. She co-founded Women, Women's International Network on Gender and, and Human Security in 1998 and and gender egalitarian, a global indigenous women's knowledge in 2005. She has chaired and served on a number of um, constitutional and company boards since 2013. Since her childhood under apartheid, she has remained committed to the, to the systematic transformation towards realizing justice for all. Um, with that, um, over to you, Ms. Benedict. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm very grateful to be here with you today. Um, and um, yeah, so if you don't mind, I will um, start by thanking the Free State University, uh, the South Campus in particular, the research office and the libraries for hosting us, um, and especially the VC for rearranging his very busy schedule to join us today. When our leaders show their commitment to our hitherto marginalized work, they inspire us to recommit to the necessary institutional and societal transformation our country desperately still needs. Ms. Jeanette Molopiani and Ms. Dina Mashiani of Free State Libraries, our hosts today, thank you. We're honored to collaborate with you. Our VC, uh, Prof. Peterson, and the South Campus Principal, Dr. Madiopi, you walk your talk in showing your commitment to transformation and your support for Indigenous women scholarship and indeed arts. Ubuntu, we are because of you, because of each other. Our book is readily available in all bookshops nationwide as well as online and around the world online in Kindle form and um, hard copy. Um, so here's our pretty book. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Our book program is going to start and end with a renowned poet. We're going to start with Anna Ferris and end with Khadija Tracy Higa, both of whom I have um, shared uh, poetry stages with over many decades. After Diana's opening, we'll have three chapter contributors following my introduction and Khadija obviously closing our book discussion. 
uh, we hope we show in this way the essential interdependence of the arts on life itself and indeed on scholarship as well. My mother is indigenous and hence I am. We are because we care, we are because we belong. I'm now going to read for you a Diana Ferris's bio and then she will perform one of two poems. I, I don't know which one she selected, she's kept it a top secret, whether it's a tribute to Sarah Buckman or the Bones. Our poet of the nation, Diana Ferris, is obviously a writer, poet, performance poet, and storyteller. Her work has been published in various collections and some serve as prescribed texts for high school learners. Indeed, it could even serve in primary schools. In 2012, Diana received the inaugural Mbokodo Award for Poetry. Her third book, Die Friede Kom Later, The Peace Comes Later, was launched in July 2019. She is truly internationally acclaimed for the poem she wrote for the indigenous South African woman, Sarah Bartman, who was taken away from our country under false pretenses and paraded as a sexual and biological freak in Europe. This poem touched the heart of the French Senate and upon hearing it, they unanimously voted that Bartman's remains should come home. This poem is published in the French law, a first in French history and I surmise in, his, in, in, in legislative history in general. Diana's work continues to influ influence matters of race and ethnicity, sex and gender, and reconciliation. We are very grateful to have Diana with us today. Over to you, Diana. Unmute your microphone, Di. Unmute. Unmute. Perfect, okay. We're ready for you. Thank you. All protocol observed. The bones, the white dry bones we dusty tears. They have been naked for 200 years. If these are the gifts that your fathers left you, if these are the souvenirs that you now cling to, if these are the medals that their victories brought, if these are the trophies for which they have fought, then show me the lines where the battles were drawn. Paint me the hills as it stood at dawn. Recount the cries that slashed through the night. Disclose your reason for that one-sided fight. If logic is the law that we live by, if evolution made our fortunes multiply, why do you hold on to bones that cannot talk? Is it with their pain and agony with which you wish to talk? If abundance is only found in grass green fields, why hunger for crops that the scorched earth heals? The white dried bones, we dusty tears. They have been naked for 200 years. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, we're very grateful to you for always showing up and for your most moving and beautiful poems. In the middle of the book, I forgot to say, there's the most gorgeous um, photographs, uh, including one from Brazil. But, you know, it shows our rock art and other beautiful sacred sites. So... So it's a very beautiful book, aside from poetry, aesthetically. Now I'm going to speak very briefly about my own presentation, if you will indulge me. And then I will introduce each um, panelist in turn, each contributor to the book. Um, our book critically opens new pathways for decolonial scholarship and the reclamation of indigenous self-definition by women scholars. It is long overdue that as indigenous women, we, we write our own her story. We define our own contemporary cultural and socioeconomic conditions and ideate future visions based on our lived realities, which are socially and gender egalitarian, matricentric, beyond heteronormative, based on nonviolence or peace, ecologically responsible, and indeed God is loving for those who are fond of indigenous deities or spirits. As the second largest continent, Africa embodies diversities. Our rainbows of matricentricity are visible in the desert Berbers of North Africa, the Dagara of West Africa, and my own matrilineal son of the Kalahari, my Mensa, my mother's people. 
As Africa is diverse, so too indigenous wisdoms are plural. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, states that indigenous peoples can define themselves. So by international law and national law, if my mother said she was indigenous, and we trace our lineage from mother to daughter in the infinite matriliney, then I am indigenous. And my life, spirituality, scholarship reflects that indigeneity from helping women with example, Priscilla DeWitt uh, years ago in the Kalahari to build a hospitality facility that Magdalena Stienka still runs in Andres Vale to volunteering my former NGO in gender's capacity building workshops across the vast Northern Cape, the green Kalahari and elsewhere sharing resources. This book is one further contribution I offer with humility to the various communities I have served over decades since birth. This book and my life's work acknowledge that consciousness and past, present, future are continuous, like waves in the endless ocean. We transcend the traditional academic focus on the intellect to speak more with compassion from the heart, drawing on ancient wisdom to which I definitely do not stake a claim, but instead acknowledging indigenous wisdom as endless as matter in ever expanding space. My work reflects some of the many African societies that are matrix centric today, from Angola to Zimbabwe. I discuss some of the central tenets of the egalitarianisms practiced, how we can mainstream these learnings into our thinking and practices of of co-creating alternatives to the dominant capitalist patriarchy. Most mammalian life stems from a womb, from the maternal. The English word mammal is derived from the Latin mama or breast. So human life springs from the womb, from the mother. Mitochondrial DNA, a genetic gift from mother to daughter without end. Patriarchy is the rule of fathers or men over all. Women, children, babichi, enslaved, and animals, skies, oceans, land. By contrast, women are the source of all life. We all come from a womb, from a mother. So matricentric societies honor and center women. For some 20 years, we indigenous matricentric women around the world have explored the concept of rematriation. Instead of repatriation, it's rematriation with mater at the center. It really just means reclaiming of ancestral remains, spirituality, culture, knowledge and other resources. Going back to Mother Earth, a return to life and co-creation rather than patriarchal destruction and colonization. As a restorative imperative, we need to reclaim our woman-centered or matricentric ancestry. Matricentric spirituality, cultures, knowledge, and resources indeed rematriate our societies. One Kalahari healer, Ma Menaputo, describes her carefree childhood, hunting small animals like rabbits and young buck with a bow and arrow and making him playing with dolls. As elder convening healing circles, it is her lifelong male partner who holds a space for her gently offering her water as she emerges from the trance state. Nonviolence or peace, carefully codified through centuries of complex conflict resolution methodologies, are intrinsic to matricentric societies. Cooperation and collectivity over competition and rampant individualisms, especially in the modern social media age. The gift paradigm in which needs are met through unilateral gifting without patriarchal reciprocity or bartering is a critical element of matricentric societies where generosity is practiced over selfishness and greed. Connected to all the above is compassion, compassion, feeling with, feeling for our African notion of Ubuntu. I am because I belong. I am because I care. To be compassionate, one needs trust and respect. Love of self and all can be contrasted with patriarchal self-loathing and systemic distrust and hatred of all. One needs women at the center of, at the center of societies, co-creating social values and practices 
that are humane and nonviolent, that nurture and foster individual and collective growth, that heal and care, that do no harm and definitely do not exploit. There is enough light in the cosmos for all the stars to shine. One star's light does not diminish the glitter of other stars, and shining together, all the stars united can be brighter than even the sun. Together, we continue to define our own her stories and histories and our scholarship for ourselves as indigenous peoples in Africa. In the words of Mama Naputo, Kalahari San healer, the San people found power in the light of the moon. The ancients made a queen and hoisted her up into the sky where she became the moon. The people danced in the light of the moon. This is where we find our healing power, close quote. May today's new moon inspire us to continue rematriation, a return to the mother, the womb, where beginning and end are all one, a return to indigenous compassion. I am because I care. I am because I belong. I am because I serve my various communities through action throughout my life. I am because of each of you, including the leadership. Thank you so very much. We are now going to go to Dr. Babawa Mahokwana, and I'm going to read her bio as um, she is put on the spotlight. Dr. Oh, yes, I forgot to say the chapter, my chapter title is around egalitarianism, rematriation, reclaiming the indigenous matricentric egalitarianism. Now to the next chapter by Dr. Babalwa Mahutwana, the director of the Center for Women and Gender Studies at Nelson Mandela University. Her chapter is titled Gendering Social Science, Ukubuyiswa of Maternal Legacies of Knowledge for Balanced Social Science Studies in South Africa. Babalwa is a senior lecturer in, lecturer in sociology and anthropology, and I've said that she is director of gender studies. Um, she's a fellow of the African Humanities Program, research associate, associate for the South African Research Chair Initiative, or SAGI, chair in social policy at UNISA, and former president of the South African Sociological Association. She's a recipient of the National Research Foundation First Rand Foundation sabbatical grant for project on women-centered vernacular sociology of the Eastern Cape. We are deeply privileged that such a busy woman, such a, such a busy scholar, is able to was able to contribute to this book during the pandemic and to join us here today. Thank you, Babawa. We are all yours. Thank you so much, uh, BM, for such a generous uh, introductions. And, and also, I would like to echo Diana as well to say all protocol observed. I don't want to be uh, chucked out at the University of Free State because I didn't mention names. Um, but I feel like it is fitting for me just to mention that I was once a staff member in that university in my earliest years <laughs> when I started in the academy. Um, so it feels good to be back in this platform. Um, I'm just going to speak uh, briefly about the overview of my chapter, um, less than 10 minutes, so that maybe we can engage later on. Um, basically, the chapter in itself, it's seeking to, um, <clears throat> to talk about how to uh, a deal with what Professor Andre Kiet calls intellectual stagnation of social sciences and humanities in South Africa. And it was inspired by uh, uh, the work that I had done already, the conceptual work that I had done around uh, Umakulu as the body of knowledge, uh, which is in the Sikosa, the grandmother as the body of knowledge you know, um, and then, um, so I'm just going to read the first page so that I can just talk about my argument in general. So uh, basically, if what we know, how we know, and, uh, and, and the foundations of our knowledge 
uh, 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 is mostly influenced by our mothers, our aunts, our grandmothers. Why is it that most of the disciplines that we, uh, most people, especially in this webinar, you know, we don't see those kind of knowledges that have informed our own knowledge uh, systems. In a way, trying to speak to what the Vice Chancellor uh, Peterson has mentioned about reclaiming values, reclaiming the knowledges that we lost. But I'm using what is called the ontology of the mother or um, the maternal ontology that has influenced how we know and what we know uh, 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 when it comes to social sciences. Pramesh Lalu uh, in 2011, a historian at UCT, wrote that in South African uh, social sciences and humanities, there was always a link between the racialized apartheid government policies and the state and the humanities project to resolve the native question. So if then there was this collaboration between humanities and social sciences, according to Pramesh Lalu's uh, uh, understanding, with the state at the time, what should be the agenda of humanities and social sciences after the formalized, obviously formalized apartheid system has been ended in 1994. It, it reminds me of uh, Bernard Makubane, uh, who was writing in 1968, when he challenged social anthropologists uh, to imagine a future where strange societies and primitive societies would disappear. And the disappearing of the primitive, he argued, would challenge the very existence of the discipline of anthropology. And in many spaces globally, this has been proven to be true, um, where the discipline itself has faced a lot of existential crisis. So my approach to the social science and humanities intellectual stagnation that is said by Kiet is that maybe it's time to rethink our focus within humanities. And, and, and um, especially during COVID, where we saw that um, uh, 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 all the natural sciences began to be the focal point at which the state started asking questions of solutions to our current pandemic, you know, and obviously ignoring some of the stuff that was said by humanities scholars and social sciences scholars for a long time around issues of inequality, social reproduction, crisis, and all of that. Um, so, if we are saying that there's an intellectual stagnation, and 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 Kiet says as early as 1922, uh, 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 in Austria, one historian said uh, uh, there was a crisis in humanities during that time, and we see this after decade after decade that people are pronouncing this crisis. As a result, we have had I think in 2011. The, the, the establishment of uh, um, NHSS, uh, the National Institute for Social Science and Humanities in South Africa, to resolve some of these crises. But in this, in this uh, uh, paper, what I'm trying to say is that we need new alternatives uh, 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 in terms of how to approach knowledge. Because what has happened is that the current masculine capitalist model of thinking about scholarship, about our disciplines, whether it's sociology, anthropology, and uh, uh, it seems to continue the crisis. So how about we move and recenter knowledges that have been neglected? Uh, Paul Zeleza says uh, in history, for example, women uh, uh, were invisibilized, uh, they, were, they, they, they were only represented in terms of their reproductive roles as mothers, wives, and all of that. But um, the history as a discipline was very much infatuated with the lives of the great men. 
you know, which then made the whole legacy and contributions of many women within the discipline, you know, disappear. So for me, what I'm saying is, if every day, I, I know I've got, I'm running out of time already. I'm sorry, Benedict. If, for example, most of our African leaders today, you read any biography, you will notice that most of them, they tend to narrate the history, the impact of leadership and how they got to know about politics and political economy in general through Umakulu or the grandmother or some sort of maternal influence. For example, recently, uh, um, uh, uh, Shireen Hassim, when she was writing about the, 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 the marriage contract between Winnie and, and Nelson Mandela. She, she talks about how Winnie's grandmother uh, was so influential in her leadership values. And, 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 and she continues to say, if I can just quote it, uh, I always love this quote, sorry. Um, she says in, in, this, in this paper, uh, she wrote in 2019, and I quote, um, while the lineage that mattered in Winnie's heroic narratives was that of her father, Columbus, the authoritative figure was Winnie's grandmother, called Umakulu, by her grandchildren. She was a role model, tough and robust, with the physique of a fighter. She taught me, uh, she taught me the power and strength of a woman. Umakulu rejected the modern Christian and westernized aspirations of Amakolwa, a group that included Gertrude's mother, Gertrude's family, which is Winnie Mandela's mother. Instead, she emphasized stories of anti-colonial resistance. From her grandmother, Winnie derived a sensibility of race. In part of this was the way of a rumor about Gertrude's white ancestry. So we begin to see how Shireen Hassim uses uh, 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 this maternal heritage or the grandmother's ontology of Winnie Madigizala Mandela to explain her leadership tactics and how she gets to understand race politics. <clears throat> I can continue and talk about uh, the, the excavation that was done by Tozama April <clears throat> on Charlotte Maclegg, how she uses Katie Makanya. I can talk about um, the works of Mamutisani, uh, uh, Dr. Numa Tamsang Latisani, how she traces the whole intellectual legacy of the Eastern Cape through Nosutu Jotela, who was the great grandmother of Diosoga, one of the most of, uh, widely known intellectuals of, uh, 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 of this part of the country. And how all of them, they use this maternal uh, ontology to arrive, you know, in, 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 in knowing what they know. So, but, but when we're talking about Tukbuyiswa, it's, it's, uh, I was using it as a metaphor, but also as a, as, a, as a language of ritual to say that if we want a balanced social science, we're going to have to rethink what um, how we have positioned women in social sciences and humanities to be an add-on in our courses, but they have to be part of the foundations. For example, if you are going to teach in sociology, if you are going to teach uh, uh, Emil Dukheim issues of suicide, why is it impossible to teach the works of Fatima Mir, who wrote a very beautiful classical text on race and suicide in South Africa. If you're going to, to teach, for example, uh, um, um, uh, the political theory introduction uh, using Franz Fanon, why are you leaving Ellen Kuzwayo behind? There seems to be a very deliberate imbalance that we have come to accept in our curriculum. So, I, let me just make the last example before I, 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 I let uh, Benedict uh, continue with the program. I always say if, if you um, look at the works 
of this one of the greatest black feminist thinkers of our century, uh, uh, Gloria Watkins. She wrote using her great grandmother's name, producing more than 30 most influential texts on race, class, gender, pop culture, arts, children's books. And in her work has become very much canonical as well, which is Bell Hooks. Uh, Bell Hooks was her great grandmother. So this ontology of grandmothers that we have managed to push aside when they form the very foundations of who we are, it is, it's, it's not coincidental. The last example that I would like to make, the, the, the paper is quite long, is the work of Toni Morrison, uh, one of the greatest literature writers of the century. You know, um, um, she also writes about the impact of the grandmother in her writings. And we know how her work has tended to, to centralize the black experiences, the mother-daughter relations, you know, and allowing other writers to write from this ontology of the mother. So, one of the problems that I was trying to deal with in this paper was this increasing uh, uh, um, misappropriation of what is called African culture, you know, in contemporary South African politics and public sphere. Where you see that there's an increased misunderstanding of conservatism, which are in a way unfounded and are, are historical because now you see all sorts of behaviors of how to treat women, of how to uh, put women in their place as something that is African, of you know, all sorts of behaviors that are being explained by tradition, of which if you look at the prehistorical uh, 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 conditions of women and men in Africa, lots of, of, of writers in Africa, Diop, Oyewumi, Amajume, all sorts of writers, Zeku, they have been consistently writing about how <clears throat> social organizations of these different societies were always organized around the, 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 the age and seniority. For example, one last example, uh, uh, when I talk about how to access this social sciences that is balanced using indigenous languages, it's, it's the, uh, if, if you're in my language, we've got a, a firstborn daughter, which is Uma Fungashe. And Uma Fungashe is uh, the, the, the most senior. When you're saying Uma Fungashe, you're saying Uma Fungashe is someone who is uh, the, the one that we swear on, basically. That's a direct translation. Everyone in the house is younger than Uma Fungashe. Well, it, and that is normally a female head. And that, those kind of roles and responsibilities have been misconstrued because of how colonial education and religious extremism in African continent has taken shape so that they can continue to obliterate the histories that have benefited women to gain a sense of power and language to explain their positionality in society. So, once we go back, Sibuyise, this kind of histories and build on these languages, we'll begin to see a social sciences that can connect to the students' collective memory uh, that they bring with in their classrooms. For those few words, thank you so much. I hope I had more time, but unfortunately, thank you. And um, thank you, Babalba. That was truly inspiring. And from the chats, it seems that it's hit a nerve and it's moved uh, people very much. Don't get stressed, people. We're going to have um, questions and answers and discussion uh, shortly. Uh, we're now going to go to our second book contributor. Uh, this is a most inspiring, uh, you know, coming together of people in this book during a pandemic in some six or so intense months. We have Professor Anna Leita Aguia, who's a professor of Brazilian literature at the Federal University of Bahia. Her chapter is called The Falling Sky, some notes about originary peoples in Brazil. Um, 
She's Professor of Brazilian Literature at the University of Bahia and a postdoc at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She specializes in Brazilian literature, biographical criticism, comparative literature, studies on the nation and image studies, and has written many articles on these themes. Currently, she's researching anti-colonial theories and arts in the tropics. Anna is also a visiting professor at the Center for African Studies under the NIHSS Pre-Colonial Catalytic Project and collaborates in research for the Koyen San Unit and on the teaching of the African Studies major, Political Economy of Africa. We are privileged to have you with us, um, Professor Agia or Anna. Um, please go ahead. Uh, me too, Bernadette. Thank you so much. And thank you all for these strong and impressive speeches. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, and I'd like to start by saying thank you again to Dune and to Bernadette for the invitation to publish a paper in this book, Rethinking Africa. It's been an honor to get to know so many women thinkers for whom I have such profound admiration. I'd heard the names of many of these women before I arrived in Cape Town to do my research with June about the strategies used by indigenous groups to survive in these current times, a kind of comparison between Brazil and South Africa. Because Brazil and South Africa have many aspects in common, colonization, apartheid, and even if we don't have an official apartheid in our history, a quick look around in Brazil would make you realize that we do, in fact, have a form of racial segregation still, despite all the miscegenation and various theories that have tried to prove that Brazilian mixed people are a positive outcome of colonialism, maybe because Portuguese culture was like more open to the diversity, to diversity. Such misunderstanding has brought our contemporary history to a hard place. We are the happy people, fascinating people among misery in a large country, despite the hard reality of the system of government we live under. This makes it necessary to rearticulate the way we've been narrated by official historiography. And so indigenous voices, women's voices, poor people's and black people's voices must demand a reset. In my paper, I analyzed the situation regarding various breaks in the continuum in my histories, in my country's history, taking as an example the falling sky a book recorded by the Vico Penawa and translated from Yanomam language into French by Bruce Albert. The Yanomam people are hunter-gatherers and like many other indigenous groups, they still exist and are an example of other ways of living with the most important element being that they don't want to be part of Brazil. As with many other countries, we also have our own Palestine. Some indigenous groups are struggling to get and to regain their land tenure so that they can live on the land and use it under their terms and under their cultural norms, which does not mean existing like Brazilian farmers or commercial enterprises. The difference between usufruct or common land on one hand and possession on the other hand separates worlds and peoples. In my, pap in my paper, I also tried to understand better how some decolonial and anthropological theorists like Marisol de la Cadena, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, Stuart Hall, Ramon Grossvogel, could help us better understand indigenous thought and its relationship to land, territory. For Viveiros de Castro, despite the good intentions expressed in the Brazilian constitution, it's clear that the state intends to impoverish indigenous people. 
This translates into people who are landless and completely dependent on sporadic governmental help in the form of so social financial assistance programs. In this way, it's easier for the state to manipulate helpless people into becoming part of the new liberal program and that we are all in some ways poisoned by. Some women narrators such as Carolina Maria de Jesus from Brazil, Rigoberta Menchu from Mexico and Domitila Chungara from Bolivia are the voices who wrote out of poverty. Some of them huh? we have lots of, but I'm just mentioning these three women, uh, are the voices who wrote out of poverty and who denounce current systems of slavery and keep alive the memory of being pushed off their lands and how underground contemporary jobs such as mining in Africa, in Brazil or anywhere else can destroy communities, families and nature. These books written or dictated by these authors reveal what Viveiros de Castro formulated about being assisted by the state. The particular point is that all these women writers had matriarchal spirit, class consciousness and an incredible sense of belonging to somewhere lost, but possibly regained. Furthermore, for some time now and more recently, during the global COVID-19 pandemic, Brazilian shamans all from over 300 indigenous villages have been warning the world and Brazil about diseases afflicting society, such epidemics caused by mosquitoes, in particular dengue, zika, chikungunya, and last but not least, the gold fever and its contamination of natural resources, rivers and seas by greedy mining corporations. All things considered, these diseases are only an extension of the biological warfare to which indigenous people in Brazil have been subject since the 1500s and since 1492 in the Caribbean and neighboring areas. In addition, extraction of natural resources for export, excessive cattle breeding and monoculture have increased the existing self-colonization that Brazil continues to self-inflict. Um, it's kind of a briefing of my paper and later we can discuss a little bit more. Thank you all. Thank you, Bernadette. Thank you so much, Ana Aguilera. It's a privilege to have collaborated with you on this book and for you to have made the time to be with us today. We're now going to go to the next contributor, um, an independent scholar, Dr. Sarah Malutani Henkeman. Her chapter title is called Ancestral Letter to Unborn Descendants. She's a transdisciplinary practitioner scholar who produces knowledge from the standpoint of the oppressed. She's the mother of two adult sons and became of aware of the more ubiquitous, invisibilized nature of the criminalization of blackness, both inside and outside of South Africa, as these boys grew taller. It is a belief that knowledge produced from the impact side of dehumanization is first about self-determination, then about a counterpoint to mainstream knowledge and modes of knowledge production. She recognizes that she will die structurally oppressed, but that she will do so in the course of decolonizing her mind, a lifelong process. Finally, she recognizes that inasmuch as oppression is an external force in the lives of the dehumanized, it's also met and matched by an internal, mainly denied force internalized oppression that presents in too many masked ways to mention. She has a PhD from the Colonial Academy and thus much to disabuse. I love Sarah's bio. Welcome, Sarah. Why don't you log off and log back in? And um, perhaps while you do that, um, 
we can have um, Khadija Higa's poem. Sarah? And um, could the technicians please assist Sarah um, with getting her sound resolved? I'm very sorry. Khadija, you need to now unmute your mic. Yeah. Great. Before you say, I just want to introduce you, if I may. Is it okay? Yes. <laughs> Khadija Higa is a, 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 a lifelong friend and poet uh, of mine, and I have deep respect for her. She's going to read a poem in our book called Kamisa, which she wrote um, for our book. Mm -hmm. She has many names. Khadija Tracy Carmelita Higa is a celebrated poet, actor, facilitator, cultural activist, and writer who hails from the Cape Flats. She performs in a number of films and television shows. In fact, in art and flesh is the Burgemeester, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and she also does other performances, varied performances. Most recently, she appeared in a film on the politics of hair on the Cape Flats. In 2019, jazz art used Khadija's poetry for their dance drama, Cape of Ghosts, during which she narrated the story of land and landlessness on stage with the dancers. She also plays a lead role in a forthcoming film shoot on Hangberg in Hout Bay, Cape Town. The Center for Curating the Archive at the University of Cape Town commissioned Khadija to write the poetic script for the historical film on the Washerwoman Slaves, and Kirsten Dunbar Chase commissioned her to write a poetic script for a short film on the Cape's so-called colored people. Among others, she has collaborated with the District Museum in Cape Town, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, Ezekiel Museums of South Africa, Cape Town Museums, many other museums, and indeed a great many institutions. It is a privilege for us to have Khadija Higa with us today. Thank you, Khadija. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi there. Um, goodness, this has been interesting. And I'm so sorry that Sarah can't unmute herself. <laughs> I feel very honored to be part of such uh, incredible women, uh, women's group uh, today. So let me just get into the poem, which is titled Kamisa, which incidentally, Bernadette, was written for the new Cape Town Museum. It was commissioned by them. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to correct that. All right, so this is Kamisa. Kau, blood. Kau means blood in Koikoi Huab. Blood is tricky, defiant. Blood is contradiction. It messes the historical rule with the exception, savages the spaces between the lines and bibliography marked expert, fouls the air where identity equals one bloodline. Once upon a time at the Cape, someone distilled your roots down to rape, managed the magma and roughage transported on rivers and seas across stone and sand to this thing, colored. It doesn't carry sweet in the name. Colored means secret, means better, means worse. You live in the great sea of old ships with bloody secrets chained up in silent memory. You live in the great absence of koi koi and san. You live inside the great mouth of too many roots in a place where the lie has become the truth. The lords of history have cut through passions. Colored, nothing about it comes mm. cheap. It comes with a deck too hefty and a tide mm -hmm. that carries no good blood in it, they say. 195 mm -hmm. bloodlines fail <laughs> in the present, and the stone star watches the children devil their eyes with divide and rule. Colored. It is the blood of untimely history. It is a woman spread legs akimbo across Biren and Katzenel and Buchen. She murmurs from the clouds the name Kamisa. She's a devastated monologue on a ghost river tongue, salvaging the riddles of San, Kuna, the Kasa, the tides of Nguni tribes leaning southwest to southeast. She is many skins of the Amakwa. She is Amakwa. 
greeting the stolen, the buyers, the truants, the travelers of land and sea. She is Amakwa, steeping rivers of blood in the crewmen, the indentured, swaddling the drifters, the maroons, the manillas, those refugees of labor, lavishing the many, the needy, the hunted, the lost, the freed. She is Bengali Indigen Mix. Her name is Angela. Her name is Anna, daughter of Angela, her blood mitigated by marriage to a white man. She is unknown, her name lost in the sea of perils. She arrives, flavored with the smell of nil manel plucked from the fields of Sri Lanka. She's a trinket stolen from the Kampong Maiji, offering to the ocean where nothing returns. She is China, compassing the Indian Ocean in ages before colonies. Yes, some 960 years AD, in the times of Song and Lao, Chinese feet touched this eastern coastline. She's moments with Koi Koi and Amakosa, suffering in invisible ink. Her name is Krotua. Her name is Auchimoa. Her name is Sara, Susanna, Peternella, Johanna, Amusain, Inzinga, Elsie, Zara, Christina. Her name is Angola, Timor, Japan, Siribon, Ethiopia. Her name is unknown. There will be no gravestone. Colored. She's the tide that rolled in from every side of our great mountain and river, collecting blood and words set in the stone tablet of Uriquajo's Rosetta. She's the story of you and me before and beyond. From the cradle circle of the Tau Tau to the Kaskama, come the feet planted in the soils of many places, come the children of Kui Kai unburdening these stories from labels aggressive with greedy history and the stink of dirty pure blood ideas. Now the time is here when the parrot of lessons learned will speak unburdened truth into wombs. This is a story as old as all stories. As we shake the devil from our eyes, this is the Amma. Freedom walking strong across centuries. Come, the children of Tui Kaip. We are a multitude of voyages in blood. By the way, Ama is truth. Is truth. Thank you, Truth for Khadija, Tracy, Carmelita, Higa, Soul Sister uh, from the Cape Flats. We really I'm very much uh, grateful to you for having contributed your poem to our book and for being with us today. Um, we're now going to see whether Sarah Malotani Henkeman is able to be seen and heard. Unmute yourself, Mike, uh, Sarah. Unmute your mic. Can someone unmute? Can the tech person please uh, unmute Sarah's mic for us? And Khadija Higa was almost praise singing for Sarah's presentation. Well worth waiting for. Uh, maybe I could unmute Sarah. Nope. Let me go to Sarah. I need the tech person to unmute Sarah, please. Okay. There's something wrong with your sound, Sarah. I'm so sorry. We can't hear you. On my end, it looks as if you mute it. Um, I'm unsure what to do. Oh, I think um, while Sarah's trying to sort out her tech issues with um, with Dina assisting her, because I sent Dina her number. Uh, yeah, there seems to be a tech issue on Sarah's side, which is our humble apologies. Perhaps um, someone could... Um, assist uh, Sarah so she can come and participate in the conversation we're going to have now. Um, she's truly the most remarkable um, 
the most remarkable scholar and self-challenging in her life's work. She challenges herself as much as she challenges the rest of us to transform. We are now, ladies and gentlemen, until Sarah fixes her, 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 um, her tick, um, which she needs to unmute herself on that end, um, we want to open for questions and comments um, uh, to all of us um, as we thank each contributor for the excellent presentations and our poets for their most beautiful poetry. Um, yes. We'll take questions and comments. Um, Sarah, don't stress, um, sort your tech out and when you're ready, just send me an SMS um, and we'll just plug you in. Um, so not to worry in the meanwhile. I hope you can at least hear me. So let's move to questions and, and, and discussion, colleagues. Um, I want to know if you have any um, profound questions for us. If we have enough time at the end, okay. Um, someone is asking for Sarah's number and I'm quickly going to give it to them. And um, forgive me. I, when asked to multitask um, nowadays, you know, and some of us older people, middle-aged people, um, yeah, all this multitasking. So people are thanking the contributors and the and the poets, and they love everything very much. Anastasia Matsai says it's an interesting topic, Babawa, such topics of the role of women in society are discussed in platforms like the Southern African Folklore Oral Society in our own indigenous languages and so on. Um, and so um, indeed Babawa's um, presentation um, and her work has stimulated a great number of people who wanted to question the issue of um, traditions uh, and what passes as tradition and culture in our country. And so um, why don't you kick us off, Dr. Madiopi? When I was a CRL Rights Commissioner, um, it was our challenge around how people have, you know, how cultures have changed and um, how people have used the culture and misused the culture from uh, malpractices like um, Ukutwala, where young girls are abducted into forced marriages. Uh, but, you know, and there are also beautiful cultural and traditional practices that we have, but how we have misused uh, some of these practices against girls and women. So people were very moved by Babala's presentation as well as uh, other contributors and poets. So, um, yeah, people are overwhelmed, says Joy Owen. Uh, they, we've left them with a lot to feel and think about. There are many resonances. Um, she just wants to let it all settle into her bones and how much she appreciates us. So anyone wishing to speak? Yes, Babawa, thank you. Let's challenge some more traditions. <laughs> When, when Khadija was reading that poem, you know, and, and obviously, I think, you know, my, my, um, my touch on the, the works that Diana was also, you know, talking about the bones. And, and I just wanted to make connections. Um, since I didn't have a, a part on my page to talk about um, uh, the enslaved African girl, Kratoa, who was then um, uh, uh, what's this, enslaved to a, to a point of becoming a nanny at a very early age. And how those histories, if you move to Kratoa, to Sarah Batman, Sarah Batman, I can't even call her by name, Yvette uh, 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 Abrams says, it's actually very disrespectful to even talk about Umamu Batman uh, 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 the the manner in which the scientific community, you know, laid bare <clears throat> her nakedness to the world, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I thought I should make connections when it comes to the the histories of violence against women, <clears throat> and and how the histories of violence, you know, uh, uh, in a way can be traced from these uh, indigenous women at a very early age, Krotoa. Uh, and, and also Uma Musara Batman. And now we see this thing as becoming 
some sort of a, a norm where women are every day abused, obviously, and sexual minorities. So it's, it's, uh, it's also important in how we deal with the violence that is faced with, the gender-based violence that we're, uh, is faced with uh, today, to start within our social sciences and humanities, uh, um, historicizing some of these problems. Because when you historicize how uh, 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 women, especially African women, uh, uh, are portrayed in media, how African women uh, um, are not believed in stories of rape and all of that, if you look at the histories of Sarah Batman, Kotowa, and all the way to the contemporary society, you look at there are links and how those things, they kept being perpetuated. Obviously, we see in, in the books of uh, the travelers' journals within the, 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 the archives, how they, they looked at um, black women's bodies as unrapeable. So these histories uh, 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 around these uh, uh, women, you know, and, and violence can help us understand this injuring and stubborn way of, 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 of um, how violence continues every day uh, 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 um, uh, uh, against women. So I just wanted to make those connections because I do have it in the paper. I see uh, Sarah is back. Thank you. Thank you, Babalwa. You're such a star. Um, Sarah, Henkerman, we are now going to you. We are delighted that your tech has been sorted, though it still looks as if your mic is muted. Sarah, can you say something? Sarah's mic on my end, my screen. Hey, Anna. I think she needs to unmute herself. Can I come in, Ben, while Sarah is still trying to sort out her, her mic? Dr. Mario, Yes, maybe let me come in and try to uh, turn on your video, Dr. Madiopi. I'll do that right away, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. I simply just want to, uh, uh, you know, ask Babalwa and to just look at that. What is your thinking, Babalwa? You know, I've been listening at you. And uh, I just want to, you're thinking of, uh, uh, as a scholar about the issue of this African culture, the so-called, you see, I'm doing that in, in codes, you know, hiding in, 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 in African, in the name of culture where widows, in particular, women are expected to be following certain rules, you know, again, rules as set, you know, those rules which are, I don't know who set the rules, by the way, the rules that, you know, this must happen, Baba, and after this month, this must happen, and after this month, this must happen, and you shouldn't touch this, you shouldn't kiss this one because of you being a widow however having said that what is what makes us as africans think that that should be done only for women rather than you know a, 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 a man because in most cases men don't do that they don't do that they use wearing black Yes, I wear black if I, because I want to, but I don't want to wear black because, I, you know, I, 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 I'm a widow or I'm diseased, something like that. I don't want to do that. I love my black. I love being black because I'm black, but I don't want black to be dictated about, upon me as a gay for the day or for the year, for the month, as dictated by who? What's your take on that? Uh, Babalwa, because I can feel you as you're talking uh, as a sociologist. I feel you are really into the core of things. I wish I can sit with you and we can talk forever. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Dr. Mariyopi. You're an absolute star. Babalwa, do you want to quickly and briefly just uh, 
chip in and then we can ask other panelists to chip in as well while we're waiting for um, Sarah and Kamin to come back. I was actually going to say maybe I should open it uh, to other panelists just to, you know, to respond. Then I can touch on some of the 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 uh, 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 what's this, the recent question uh, towards the closing. But it's okay. I can I can go. Go ahead. Um, and other panelists, okay. please feel free to chip in after Babawa. Go ahead, Babawa. Yeah. No. The thing is, I think most of us. Who, who grow up with, within households where you see women, you know, uh, um, controlling, you know, the, the economics of the household, the labor of the household and all of those things um, within the continent, wherever you're coming from, you know, it's, it's very frustrating to hear every day that, you know, women should be like this, women should be like that. And and when you're also trying to locate that kind of thing, you see that it's it's not originating even within the so-called culture that is being used, you know. Um, and 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 let me just on, on this issue about married women or or, or, or widows. It's funny that you mentioned that. In this chapter, I talk about the 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 work of um, uh, Professor Lamla, the the late Lamla. He talks about the the the, the unmarried matikas where as early as 1960s they were considered as liberated you know and and, and and when you look at the the data the historiography of that time you notice that most women were actually unmarried anyway so this all of a sudden controls marriage as the institution that women are supposed to go to it's something that is uh, um in a way, recent in, in, in many different societies. But it is part, obviously, we know how the education, religion, I, I'm saying religious extremism in Africa is one of the most erosive, uh, corrosive uh, uh, um, um, aspects that we have embraced, and obviously education. So it comes from that, the conservatism comes from embracing religion in a very extremist manner that is closing off any form of open-mindedness. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Baba. Well, this again re 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 reiterates for us or reminds us that we need to bring women back into the center of society because that's where we belong and then women can determine our own agency and our own you know roles and responsibilities in society rather than you know being oppressed by it i'm wondering if anna uh, alia would like to comment and uh, even to anna and khadija on this matter uh yeah um in brazil there is a very interesting movement that is happening now that can help us to stay in touch, to live together with different uh, other societies inside our society. Teachers and professors are very from the students that just arrived at the first uh, because of some scholarships uh, given to the poor people and they are like bringing another kind of knowledge. They are, the, they are turned to the subjects, the theories, the references that we have. And most of all, they are son and daughters of uh, cleaners without fathers in their families. So they, they are very uh, powerful in, 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 some, in some way because they are like teaching us uh, how strong we can be even with this kind of huge mistakes and it's changing the way some universities, I, 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 I can't say that all of them are changing, but that ones that are really engaged in this kind of program, they are really changing their minds and this, this changing is visible. Uh, that's a, a, a way to, to live together, to, to transform. And I, I also would like to comment that in this book, the way that Bernadette and Dune and Jacana, all people involved, they, they put poems 
between academic essays. That's a, a of course a, a, there there are many formulas that we could use, but this way is like to a kind of, of joy with poems and theories, academic essays to learn uh, historiography because there are many ways to learn with it. Uh, and it's good to see it in practice. I mean, thank you. Is Sarah back and can um, we have her on now? And um, is her sound working? Yes. Or um, she, she's Sarah? back. Um, Dr. Sarah, can you please um, try and unmute yourself? Dr. Sarah, she is back. Do you know if the techie could unmute her? If she. Video connection. We're just finalizing her video connection. Thank you, Marcus. Much appreciated. The UFS libraries people are just, you know, the best between uh, advertising, marketing, and tech support. They are just very, very good people. I'm very privileged to know you. Um, I wonder while we're doing that if um, Diana and Khadija. Who are poets, but they also have um, have huge brains, as you will see from their poetry. If they um, want to make a, um, a comment on around the issue of tradition, culture, and how even you know fundamentalist religions and how we need to uh, challenge these to reclaim our spaces in society. Khadija, I see you on. Do you want to comment? Khadija, just. Is that to me again? Oh, I wanted to know if you wanted to comment on what we've been discussing now. But as you're hanging on, just let me read you um, a comment from Anastasia Mozart. I think people are shy. Uh, our, our, our audience is shy. They like to type, not to speak. But let me then read you what Anastasia Mozart says. Wearing black clothes when one is a widow or widower is not part of black culture. African women were attracted by the wives of the missionaries during the times of missionaries in African continent when they buried their loved ones. Before the missionaries came into Africa, women were wearing their clothes during the passing on of their loved ones. Um, and she hopes she's answered uh, one of her questions. So what we're talking about, Khadija, was about, and everyone else, um, is about the ways in which and how we need to work towards recentering women and claiming our own agency. You know, whether it's religion, culture, tradition, uh, misused and misinterpreted to oppress women more. Um, Khadija and Diana. And well, uh, yeah. I'm not an academic and um, I'm going to say this similar things. I'm going to take it to the same place that I, I my response to students who asked the question at Stellenbosch University about how they can combat racism. So whoever that is, can you mute your mic? Thank you. Sorry, with a teacher voice. Um, so this is what I want to say. The 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 way in which I believe, one of the ways in which I believe it's important to address that is something that people consider very hard work, <laughs> and certainly the students did when I said that, is that you need to self-monitor, and everybody needs to do that. That's where we start, isn't it? That every single day, every woman, in fact, needs to self-monitor, needs to monitor their own thinking about themselves. Because we have we have been um, brainwashed by all of these ideas and um, all this uh, historicizing about what women are and who women are in societies. So that's the first place to start. Uh, um, the other thing that I want to do, and I think Babawa mentioned uh, that I want to say, and I think Babawa mentioned this is that is a dismantling of the academic uh, mm. uh, structures mm. that uphold such thoughts and such thinking. Because, I mean, we are teaching at universities, but we are teaching within these frameworks. And so the boundaries 
and I'm sure they are being pushed by a great many people and uh, some of them here on this platform, those must also be pushed. But my main uh, um, uh, idea is that this is an everyday thing. This is an every minute thing. This is an every thought thing, an every word thing. Um, uh, uh, and to monitor those kinds of things in your everyday life and to, to also speak about this in your everyday life because on the street is where things like this matter the most. There is where the unlearning really has to start, or what do we call on the street grassroots, yeah? And it needs to it needs to filter all the way up and down. That's yeah. Thanks, Hadija. That was very very insightful and um, inspiring indeed. I note Werner Stierman's hand is up. So please keep your hand uh, up um, and hang on. Can we spotlight Sarah? Um, because I think she's now able to speak. Please go ahead, Sarah. After that, we'll go back to uh, we'll, Werner Stierman's question. Sarah, we're all yours. And it was well worth waiting for you. Hallelujah. Speak. It's very strange. I can't hear you. It's the oddest thing. And it is your voice that I wanted to close our panel, especially. People are suggesting you log in from a different device. Um, can Marcus and the others who are assisting Sarah please um, take care of Sarah? Sarah, are you, are you, can you speak now? Sarah, I can hear you, I think. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, is that you, Sarah? Great, I'm on my cell phone now. Brilliant, please speak, Angel. Um, I'm not going to talk for long. I, as a facilitator, I like people to join in. So I'm going, I'm going to first say thank you so much for being patient with all these technological problems. That's number one. Number two, all protocols observed. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? sir, I can hear, can hear you. you. Loud and yes, clear. Yes, Go ahead. So all I'm going to do then is to only deal with a conceptual framework. Instead of talking about what the book is about, I'll, I'll deal with what it is that I want to hand over to future generations, future descendants in my, in my generation and to, every, to anyone else who is interested. Um, so I'm going to ask, as a facilitator, uh, I like to engage people. So I'm going to ask everyone, please, in the room to use your imagination, your accumulated knowledge, your visceral, tacit, explicit, and vicarious knowledge, right? Imagine that you see a wagon wheel in front of you. Then first look at the horizontal line. Be clear about the horizontal line and see that as past, present and future with present in the middle. Then you imagine a vertical line. At the bottom, it's intrapersonal and right at the top, it's international and global. So after intrapersonal, there will be interpersonal, intragroup, intergroup, intranational, international. And people can, of course, add other levels of analysis and action in there. Can I check from time to time if you can hear me? Hello? Yes, found. Thank you. Please continue. Fascinating. <laughs> Right. Then imagine you see the cross-cutting lines on that wagon wheel. And you can start with any one of those cross-cutting lines. One will be psychological. The other will be 
psychosocial, another will be economic, another will be political, another social, and so on and so forth. I'm just giving an idea. So those cross-cutting lines are like units of analysis where um, we can consider the psychology of a person in the past on that horizontal line, in the present, and have an idea of what it will be like in the future. You can take the person's economic status, trace it from the past into the present, and then into the future. And so you can do with any unit of analysis, right? And then in the middle, they all cross, intersect. In the end, when you gather all of that information under the different units of analysis on the different axes, the horizontal, the vertical, the cross-cutting, you can do an intersectional analysis then, right? So what I try to do is to find images, find tools to distill years of research. I've been doing this research since 2005 and all the time I think of conceptual tools that I can pass on and then you think of what do people already know? How do you, all teachers will know this, right? So the reason why I talk about the visceral, tacit, explicit and vicarious knowledge is because all of us can think in a transdisciplinary way, whether we've been to a university or not. However, we are limited to, say, psychology, and then we know it in depth. There's nothing wrong with disciplines. All I'm saying is that we should be able to take in the entire picture and pursue in, in a secondary way the 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 book knowledge after we acknowledge that we have this knowledge in us already this is what freer talks i mean this is fundamentally what freer's work is about when he says that the teacher is not a banker doesn't should not do the banking method and think that the students or participants have empty heads there is a relationship between teacher and student and Someone once asked me in Norway and said, but not everyone, because I use the Paolo Freer uh, methodology always, and she said, but not everyone has knowledge. And said, I beg to differ. If you give a person a framework and you give them concepts, you can ask questions in a way that will bring out that knowledge from people. Now, here's the argument I'm trying to make about um, this image, this way of thinking this thought of passing the, uh, tools on um, to future generations is it became very urgent for me during the um, pandemic. Um, we could die within 14 days, any of us. We don't know who will die, who won't. And it's during that period when, or just before that, during that period that Bernadette asked me to write, I was busy with two other assignments. I put that aside. Okay. And I thought, I just need to write this now. This is the thing I thought, I'll, one day I'll write for my unborn grandchildren. I thought, let me do this now in a chapter as a first uh, um, letter. And I realized while, we all, while you were all talking and I was listening, I realized, you know what it was? It's a maternal instinct to want to save even those you don't know. Or, or pass something on to them. And um, so, yeah, this is, this is effectively what it was, passing on of tools, passing on a way of thinking that even if it is under different conditions, you'll be able to gather that knowledge in that particular way. Um, also, what that wagon wheel, instead of us reinventing the wheel for every possible uh, um, phenomenon that we that challenges us in this century and will challenge in the future. Instead of reinventing the wheel, is to say, when we think like this, we 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 think globally, we think locally, we think um, we can think 
as um, I'm going to read that first quote in my story that is by Nombenizo Gaza. Just now I have to find the page. Hello? Just checking if you're still there. Perfect. Let's find your page. Okay, I thought I was starting talking to myself. 183. And when you're ready, we'll go to three questions. We have three hands up so far. Go ahead, Sarah. We're listening to you. Read that, then I'll stop. Our starting Thank point. Thank you, Sarah. You're yes. Our starting point is a search for tools. A fine combing of his script outside that narrative. A fine tuning of the ear and the development of a wider non-linear vision that can be read backwards, sideways, and at all levels at any given moment. The relationship between the universal and the particular is one with which feminist scholars must continuously engage. That's by Nomba Nizo Gaza. I'll stop there for a moment. I, see, I can't I'm see innocent. anybody, but I don't know if, if anybody's following. So. No, we are with you, Sarah. We're very grateful. It was well worth, uh, you know, struggling to get you back on. Um, so we hope that you'll stay and keep that sound going so that in, you can respond to questions if people have. Um, we go, We have three people waiting to ask questions in the following order. We have Werner Stierman, who is an educator. Uh, and we have Diana, who is a guest, not our beloved poet first, another Diana, and then we had Rita Biele. So do we want to start with Vena Stierman? Please go ahead. Vena? Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, if there are any still left. Um, I, actually, well, I need my hand to actually have a touch of ID. Now, perhaps just just trying to to find out whether my earphone is loud. We can hear you, Jana. Just go ahead and ask um ask your question. Okay, so I really hope that this book will become available to students not only at universities but also at schools um especially your, your secondary school um i have decided the lives of my mates and you would not know i spoke to you yesterday bernie and that was the first time i heard about this book and never did I know that we are going to have this discussion today and it's going to take on or evolve into actually something that that I deem now at this moment divine intervention because I needed I really needed the encouragement and the or the courage first of all to really sit down and and start with this project because it has been on the back burner. So um, yes, Diana has assisted me to get the clarity I needed to start writing because I just talk and now I need to start writing. So thank you very much for this opportunity and forum where I can actually um, listen to you ladies and also take part. Thanks so much, Bernie. That's why I leave my mic unmuted so that I don't have to continue to mute and mute myself. We're going to go to Diana Guest with her question and comment. I wanted to, uh, oh, it is our Diana Ferris who is a guest. That's great. Uh, also, Sarah Henkeman had said, Diana, unmute your mic. Sarah Henkeman had said ways of thinking, etc., but also ways of being, ways of living, how we are in the world. And that for me is very important because we, Practice what we preach, walk our talk. So definitely ways of being. Are you ready with your question, comment, Diana? 
after which we're going to go to Retabile and Dina. Yes. Um, Mm. Thank you, thank you, uh, Bernadette, and thank you to everybody. Um, I have just started. A, 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 I don't know if it's going to be a short story or a novel, but I have um, gone and fetched a character, a, a, a young girl from 1863 in the Hex River Valley who did something profound and she's written about in, 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 this, in, this, in this paragraph in Andrew Marie Janssen's book, but um, a young coy girl of 15, 16, but no way her name is known, um, what happened to her afterwards. And I decided that I will resurrect her and I will make her part of my lineage. And I think that is what I wanted to say. We know many, many women who have contributed so much to society, but they disappear. And we, and, and as Berna said, and as she doing now, is, is that we as the writers, as the artists, we have the responsibility to go and get those characters, those women, those voices. I mean, we must put them, put them there in our novels, our poems, our plays, our films. And it must be there. We must be productive so that there will be no chance that there isn't anyone else's books. We have a duty. And we who present creative writing workshops, we must encourage those attending to go look for those women and to write about them, and to see what they have contributed, but to ask them why did they disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, part of my nation. Um, we're going to get to Retabile, and after Retabile, we're going to go to dinner. Um, Retabile, hello, ma'am. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hello everyone, thank you for the opportunity and is that the echo from the echo Okay, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. I, I wanted to uh, to respond to, I forgot um, who was talking about how women we are, you know, asked to wear this black uh, clothes when we our husband has passed on and I saw that Dr. Muzei also mentioned it that we we have been colonized we were colonized because in the past that wasn't the case and the reason for this long time of where a woman would have to wear that for almost six months up to a year was in order for this woman to be controlled we were women as we know that we from a patriarchal you know society in in africa where a woman would be told to abstain to stay away and yet a man would just take even less than a month and continue with their lives but <clears throat> the challenge is people who continued with this kind of oppressive tradition were women themselves men are ne were never part of uh, you know, that, uh, you know, those rules, there's a set of rules that women, if you lose your husband, certain rules, set of rules that you are not supposed to arrive home late in the afternoon, you're not supposed to, you know, raise your voice. It's a whole lot of rules. And these rules are usually, you know, um, implemented or, or even delivered by women themselves. So women have carried on with the oppression of other women they have you know protected these rules or these uh, laws that re oppress women it's never men if you can go through whatever literature and, and trace who are implementing or perpetuating this kind of a uh, uh, rules are women including the rape culture itself you find that if there is a rape or your child is raped 
you would rather protect your husband or a family member because you, you know what you have to protect your family you don't want people uh, you know saying you know your family this is what has happened and most of people who or who who, who protect or prevent you know perpetrators from being arrested are women themselves so if we could go back as women to say uh, let's stop protecting perpetrators let's stop to protect men with our lives and our children's life i think even the this rape culture will go to minimum but unfortunately again back to in academia we we have been singing transformation uh, um transforming uh, uh, the curriculum decolonizing the curriculum for a better word but then is that the case not really it's not the case because in as much as we want to decolonize the curriculum, we are still holding on to, uh, you know, the, the the colonial side. We following the theories and whatever. We are not creating our own theories that would work, uh, you know, into our indigenous languages. I, I invited some of, you know, uh, my colleagues who we are trying to decolonize the curriculum at higher education through writing uh, 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 papers, chapters developing material that will be used in higher education learning. In Sesotho, we moving down to say, let's use our indigenous languages. Let's prove that they have that capacity. They can be used at higher education. And this is the start because we have been singing it, but the implementation hasn't been done. And now how do we stand and say, this is Heritage Month. This is, we are embracing our indigenous languages, whereas we are there is absolutely nothing that we are doing to empower them, to make them known, to put them also there to say they are here and they are important and they are as capable as any other language. So that's another uh, input that I, I wanted to share that I'm, I'm excited. I'm happy, Bernadette, that I saw this book launch and I thought, yeah, rethinking, uh, you know, uh, Africa, it's something that we are actually doing and for to have, uh, you know, women of stature who comes to say it's about time now let's go back let's find those artists there who have been you, you know who are who have this rich history the knowledge who had a talent but they are not being recognized for why are they not being recognized it's not it's not something known but you'll find that people who are powerful people who can bring them are exactly women we are the ones who can go back there to find that those women who are not recognized to bring them here to say here they are in all platforms that we can have in all settings that we do have even those who are not that we have those who cannot even read and write but who are you know the our orality who knows who are poets who can come here without you know and and, and share their knowledge so thank you very much uh, that's what i wanted to share thank you so much Unmute, Bernadette. Sorry, I'm speaking to myself. I wanted to say Dr. Bossa is based at the University of Cape Town and academic there. Uh, for those who don't know yet, um, very, um, um, very inspiring academic. Um, Lynette Jacobs had typed in the chat saying, being, doing, becoming, and I rather like the poetry in that. I had no idea that Lynette had the poet in her heart. So I'm delighted to welcome you to the circle of poetry, Lynette Jacobs. Um, Dina has typed her question in the chat window, and I just want to check with Dina. Um, are we strict with time because we're hitting almost 2 p.m.? Oh, yes, great. Okay, great, Dina. If, Bless if you. we can be quicker, I typed my question there for the sake of time, but if we can just, um, you know, rush a bit because I believe some of the colleagues Colleagues have other commitments um, after two o'clock. Thanks, Dina. So Dina's question is in the chat. You can read it there and we appreciate it very much. Um, I want to thank everyone for their contributions. And uh, we want to close with Diana Ferris's iconic poem for Sarah Bartman, which moved the French legislature so much that they repatriated her or rematriated her remains. And indeed, it's our opening poem in the book. Diana, please unmute yourself, after which we will have Dina introduce us to Jeanette, who will close the event. 
Thank you, Diana. Unmute. Thank you. And I hope that this conversation, con conversation will help us all to come home. I've come to take you home. A tribute to Sarah Bartman. I've come to take you home. Home. Remember the felt, the lush green grass beneath the big oak trees. The air is cool there. And the sun does not burn. I have made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in wool and mint. The proteas stand in yellow and white. And the water in the stream chuckles, sing songs as it hobbles along over little stones. I've come to wrench you away, away from the poking eyes of the man made monster who lives in the dark with his clutches of imperialism, who dissects your body bit by bit, who likens your soul to that of Satan and declares himself the ultimate God. I've come to soothe your heavy heart. I offer my bosom to your weary soul. I will cover your face with the palms of my hands, run my lips over the lines in your neck, feast my eyes on the beauty of you, and I will sing for you, for I have come to bring you peace. I've come to take you home where the ancient mountains shout your name. I have made your bed at the foot of the hill. Your blankets are covered in buhu and mint. The proteas stand in yellow and white. I've come to take you home where I will sing for you. For you have brought me peace. For you have brought us Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. We're over to dinner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know about um, some of our colleagues, but from my side, um, I've learned a lot. I have so much to take away. And that also made me think of a, a one of the proverbs, a sepedi proverbs that goes like, Moyeng etlakare shuri jekawena. I will try and translate this the best way I can because sometimes when it comes to proverbs and idioms, they tend to lose context whenever they are translated. So basically, it, it means that uh, when one is expecting guests, a feast is usually prepared to cater for the people. And that's how uh, you know people in the family will also get to indulge through the presence of those vis visitors. So it, it really goes to show that, you know, what we have experienced today, uh, we have so much that we have learned. Uh, without wasting any more time, I will now hand over to Ms. Jeanette Mulopiani, who is the director of the UFS Library and Information Services to give a vote of thanks. Over to you, Ms. Mulopiani. Uh, thank you very much, Dina. I wonder if my screen can be seen. Yes. This is just a momentous occasion for us as the University of the Free State Library. What times to live in, to be immersed in such powerful voices. Uh, you know, listening to all the speakers, I just want to echo all the sentiments, all protocol observed. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for the amazing work that you have done. This is the first step of bringing the curriculum back, reclaiming the curriculum, planting the seeds of a decolonization of the curriculum. This is the first step. Your legacy will live for years to come. Uh, when I was listening to all the speeches, I was listening as, you know, as a parent to say, you know, when we sent our children to university, this is the kind of content that we want our children to be exposed to, you know, so that, you know, they rematriate, they come back to the mothers, 
they come back to the grandmothers and adore them and know the significance and the impact of who they are in their lives. You know, the ontology of, of, of mothers, you know, you know, the stories of grandmothers. As for the poems, I am just wondering why can't we sing those poems in, 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 in our churches every Sunday so that, you know, they assist us in healing the wounds that are buried deep in us, you know, the wounds that we, you know, of, of the legacy of the past, which some continue to, to live in our midst. Those poems are not only supposed to be poems, they should be turned into musicals to be rendered by our university students on the stages. So this is just, I so wish this discussion can go on and on and on and on, because really this is one of those enriching uh, discussions that we are enjoying today. Ladies, Ms. Benedette, Ms. Babalwa, Anna, Sarah, Diane, um, uh, uh, Khadija, thank you so much for really grazing us with your with your presence and enriching words. Like I'm saying, this is the beginning of the rich curriculum. This is what we are looking forward as the University of the Free State Library. So this is our collection. You are building a rich collection that will make an impact in generations to come. We will have this in hard copy and in E. So we will also make sure that one of the schools will buy a copy for the schools that we have adopted in the, the reading campaigns. Like somebody was saying, why can't this book, I think it's Khadija who was saying, why this book, it, it must be in schools as well. So that is, that, that, that is a mandate. It must be in schools as well so that our children can come back. Uh, 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 Dr. Babola mentioned some, something along the crisis in, in humanities. So this crisis in humanities really talks about what you ladies are bringing onto the table to say, let the curriculum formulate the lives of our children to be back to who they really are supposed to be. So from our University of the Free State Libraries, ladies, we will invite you again. Thank you so much. We are really really very glad that you became part of this momentous occasion in celebrating our heritage month thank you very much ladies and goodbye thank you um memolo piani um colleagues on that note we have officially come to the end of the event um thanks again to all our panelists our esteemed guests and participants for honoring the the, the invitation do enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Goodbye, colleagues. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.